as I'm going to blank because I'm nervous. <laughs> ah, excuse me. This piece that you're next to me is you're supposed to be fed up by now. Using a modern song by a group called Coup um, and having Frederick Douglass be that representation of it. Having the eye contact, which historically, you know, photography, they didn't look into the camera, they looked away because it kept their eyes from being blurry. He's staring you down. You are supposed to be fed up with the circumstances, the situations, and the way we are living. You're supposed to do something about it. You're supposed to change. So I also am very silently, but loudly, and in a way that passes language. You don't have to speak English to be able to realize he's challenging you. So now I have gone in, a, in another venue besides marching and created a revolutionary act, an evolutionary act. We are supposed to be fed up with being treated like second class citizens, or being slaves, or being used, not having the right to claim yourself. We're supposed to be fed up by now. Represent the real, KRS One, Thelonious Monk, Asaka Samsudin. He is my mentor. He's the man who helped teach me how to paint. If you're not familiar with his work, go in the hallway out here. He's had a mural in this hallway since 1968. I have one in the basement that's been there since 2006. Um, recently, I was the curator for Due North last year over at ISCC. I was able to get him a Lifetime Achievement Award. In a building right next door to where we awarded him, there is now a mural that's a public one that the city paid me to do across the way is one that they also now asked Asaka to do. So my wall is hanging across the wall, away from Asaka now, until they decide to take those down. You have to not only honor yourself, you have to help honor those who have brought you to where you are. I have Mike Crenshaw, I have uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Bobby McFerrin, Got a bunch of different, different people in the back. The concept in, in it is making sure that people who are doing something are recognized for the, what they're doing. And in turn, representing, Kara's fun, representing the real. That's what my job is. I'm done talking now. <laughs> joy and the pleasure of also being involved with some people doing some amazing things around in this community. I teach out at the Juvenile Detention Center every month. Um, I never have the same group of kids. I on average have five to ten kids. They all have brown skin on the majority. Juvenile Detention Center, JDH, uh, Donald E. Long. Kids or babies, or this is, I'm one of the last steps before they go to jail, basically giving them another possible alternative of doing something with themselves besides what they're doing making change. Also was involved in the uh, Peace and Unity Fest last year over in Northeast. There's another one again this year. There's the um, Youth uh, Evasion down at uh, City Hall at the end of the month. I'm teaching a um, seminar there as well. I had Black History Month here at Portland State. I've been asked to again, do it again next year. Solo show. Um, I'm not even trying to pretend like I remember how many shows I've had now. It's been a lot. In the last four years, I have sold almost 400 pieces of work. Each and every one of them is an original. I will not make copies. I do not make prints. This is the only one. It needs to come from my hands. It needs to be my sweat, my tears, my anger, my joy in the world. And I encourage all other artists and people who are interested in that to do that. It needs to be your heart and soul. Don't sell out. Um, cards are on all the tables. And everything I forgot to say is on my website, on my MySpace page. I do use MySpace a lot. Our kids use them. That's why I got involved. My son was using it. It's a way to stay in touch and stay in contact with the generations. And each and every one of us are supposed to do that. Whether you've got kids, nieces, nephews, whatever, you have to reach down and pull them up with you. Not about just us. Questions? No? Good. No. <laughs> Thank you, Mo. Let's say uh, thank you again. And Mo's work is for sale. Yeah. Mo's work is for sale. <laughs> and um, I believe it's for sale. You can still um, acquire um, a beautiful piece of um, art on a payment plan. Are you still doing I do, that? I do do payments. Um, 
actually just missed ending this Sunday. I had a half off because I'm moving, and I don't want to have to move all of it with me. I use my MySpace to do that as well. Um, status mentions occasionally. I'll go, I feel like selling my work off, half off the next 24 hours. That's a good time to catch me. Um, but I do take payments, and I will send them out anywhere from two to six months, depending on how much it is. Um, and I give you the piece when I've gotten the last payment. I also have work from $20 to $3,000. I want to make sure it's affordable to everybody. Everybody has a right to own real artwork. I'm happy to say that I own two pieces uh, from what's being um, shared with you today. In the back on the far right, the revolution will not be televised. That was the first uh, piece I acquired from Mo. And then over here on the left, uh, next to uh, Shirley Chisholm, and um, next to uh, Asaka Shamsuddin, Harriet Tubman. The conductor. The conductor, Harriet Tubman. Thank you again, Mo. You're amazing, you're wonderful, you're ours. Thank you. Let me do a check-in. How many students are taking Black Studies courses? How many Black Studies majors? How many Black Studies minors? Okay. Wonderful. Glad to see you all here this afternoon. And for me, it's, it's an honor to be a part of presenting this program this afternoon. It's an emotional um, moment. I'm realizing that now as I'm, as I'm standing here. And many, many thanks go to uh, my colleague, Professor Ethan Johnson, the future of our department. Uh, for his dedication and his work uh, bringing you this particular program and for all of the work that you've done around the, the Black Bag series. It is an honor to be standing here in the presence of um, my friends, these warrior brothers, friends that I have known for over 30 years plus. A lot of history, a lot of history. I want you to know that I'm a product of the Black United Front. I learned how to be an effective community <coughs> organizer through my experiences with the Black United Front and carried that valuable experience and and the community's issues into my work in the Oregon legislature. And I'll say something more about that a little later. I joined the Black United Front in 1979. How many of you were alive then? <laughs> and I had the privilege of serving as uh, Vice Chair for International Affairs of the National Black United Front and coordinator of the Saturday School Program, which was a part of the Front's uh, educational agenda. And before we go further, with the permission of uh, my colleagues on the panel and all of you, I would like to dedicate our remarks and the rest of this program today to the memories and legacies of the Reverend John H. Jackson, who served as co-chair of the Black United Front, to Mrs. Vivian Richardson, who served as faithfully as secretary of the Black United Front, and to our warrior brother, Colleen Rassan, who chaired the Education Committee. They and others um, that may will be named as we go further in our program today. They remain in our hearts forever. Forward together, backwards never. And now is still the time. And the meaning of those words will become clearer as you hear from our panelists. I will read the bios of our presenters. I'll ask uh, Charles Myrick to do uh, a self-introduction. And then I'll pose five questions. There will be time before we close for a few questions and comments from our audience. I invite you uh, to listen intently, to take notes, and to, uh, and to question. 
and to comment on what you hear. Richard Brown, going in alphabetical form. Richard is a native New Yorker. He moved to Portland in March 1976 after retiring from the United States Air Force. Pursuing his lifelong ambition of becoming an artist, he began, he began photographing around the, the black community, starting Richard Brown Photography. He photographed family gatherings, weddings, social functions, and even funerals. He became the staff photographer in the Portland Observer, which allowed him for years to become familiar with Portland and its residents and them with him. As a photographer at many uh, and any activities in the city, he became familiar with the issues, especially those that impacted the black community, eventually morphing into an activist. After being involved in many front activities, he found the areas of community livability and police relations to be areas of interest. He led a front-inspired foot patrol, the Beat Street Patrol, the rain, that rain or shine, for five hours a night, seven nights a week, for 18 months, patrol Beach Street, defined by the police as the worst corridor in the community. For over 15 years, he has facilitated another Black United Front program, Hope and Hard Work, a weekly meeting that brings city and county resources together to solve livability concerns and problems. This model was adopted by former Mayor Vera Katz to address concerns citywide. And currently he serves on the board of the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training, being appointed by Governor Ted Kulandowski. And I'm proud to say I had something to do with that nomination. Thank you very much, Richard, for agreeing to, to take on that responsibility. Uh, Richard Brown serves on the board of Albina Head Start and he volunteers weekly at the Blazers Boys and Girls Club and facilitates a weekly meeting of African American men and women to help them with their re-entry into the community after incarceration. For over four decades, Ron Herndon has successfully promoted civil rights and educational opportunities in Portland. Born in Kansas, Ronnie arrived in Portland in 1968 to attend Reed College, where he graduated with a degree in history in 1970. He has always sought to eliminate the educational disparities and the disadvantages faced by African Americans. Ronnie Herndon helped lobby Reed College administrators to establish a black studies program in 1968. He founded a bookstore and the former Black Education Center and Independent School in 1970. He later organized the Portland chapter of the Black United Front to advocate the improvement of substandard Northeast Portland schools. Working with the Black United Front, Herndon led a protest in 1982 at a Portland school board meeting demanding that predominantly African American Tubman Middle School remain open. At the time, it was felt that the closure of the school would adversely affect education by forcing students to commute long distances to other schools. He organized a one-day walkout by over 4,000 African-American children and was successful in preventing the closure. In 1983, he worked with Nike to bring the brand's first outlet store to the economically depressed neighborhood in North Portland. That's Northeast Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. And in 1984, Herndon was arrested for trespassing on the consulate of South Africa <laughs> as he led a protest against that country's policy of apartheid or apartheid. Despite, uh, I'm reading from the Oregon History Project bio. Despite the peaceful nature of Herndon's advocacy, he was closely scrutinized. And I really want you to hear this, students. He was closely scrutinized by local police and federal agents. 
As reported in 2002 by the Portland Tribune, the police intelligence unit illegally created and maintained files on the political activities and personal lives of activists during the 1970s and 80s, including that of Mr. Herndon. After nearly three decades of activism and experience in the field of education, Ronnie Herndon became the director of Albina Head Start School in Northeast Portland. He later became chairman of the board of the National Head Start Association and Early Education Advocacy Group. Mr. Benjamin Priestley, born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. All right. Ben has lived in Portland since 1978. He is currently retired and has been engaged in social services for over 30 years. He became involved with the Black United Front in Portland around 1979, focusing on local education issues, local police matters, and international involvement as, uh, as it related to uh, South Africa. He also published the monthly paper, The National Black United Front, right here in Portland, Oregon. And he is currently a co-author of a book entitled You Have Cancer. Charles Myrick, again, is one of the uh, warrior brothers in the Black United Front movement, uh, someone that I've come to know and uh, cherish uh, over the years. And Charles, I'm going to uh, ask you to uh, add to uh, my comments and just update what you've been doing uh, recently and uh, say a little bit about what you the work that you did going back to about 1978-79 with the Black and White Friend. Okay, nothing special about me. Uh, born in Oakland, California. We were there when I was three years old, I think, in 1968. Uh, Can you all hear Mr. Murray? You want to come up to the mic? I've got a microphone up. And then I'll post some questions to you. Uh, okay, my name is Charles Mike. Uh, I was uh, born in Oakland, California, moved here in 1958 when I was three years old. Uh, basically, grew up here all my life. I uh, uh, was raised by my mother, grandmother, in the, in the uh, extended family home, so was always uh, taught about issues related to black folks and what we were going through. Really experienced racism really hard here in Portland as a young kid. Uh, and I can go on and on, but I won't. I was a nice kid. I got involved with these guys over here. And, and still a nice guy. <laughs> but other than that, that's it. I was uh, in Black Night Front. I was not over security, but part of the security team. Um, also, with uh, help Ben developed the newspaper. Uh, my role in Black Night Front was that. I kind of touch everything because I'm the ball security. If, if there was going to be a rally, I was one there to make sure everything was safe and okay. And plus, I led most of those rallies. I chanted for most of it, most of that. Um, but basically, that was my role. Uh, well, we'll be there right there. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. And the only thing that you uh, left out in that was um, you made a reference to. Uh, being involved in the, the marches and the protests and the rallies and leading the chants. You, you mean like, are you fired up? Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you meant? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Here are uh, five questions um, that we'd ask you to uh, respond to as you make your presentations. One, how and why did you become involved in the Black United Front? And what was your role? Two, what were the key issues happening in Portland 
that the Black United Front focused on. Three, how was the Black United Front similar and or different from other organizations representing black people at the time in Portland? Four, in what ways was the Black United Front effective and what ways was it not? And five, how did the Black United Front communicate with its constituency? Mr. Herndon, would you like to go first? Yeah, um, Adele actually believes that we're going to remember those five questions. <laughs> <laughs> After that lengthy introduction, you can tell that none of us up here are. I don't have my glasses. <laughs> None of us up here are spring chickens. So uh, it's about our nap time in the next 34 minutes. So we'll be the uh, my involvement began really in the late 70s. I became aware of an effort in New York, an organization that's called the Black United Front, and happened to know some of the principals who were involved in organizing. It made sense to me because they were effective. They, organized around a lot of gut level issues, police misconduct, lack of economic development. Their base is in Brooklyn, New York. So on a trip back there, I was able to talk to a couple of cats I knew and thought that this would make sense in Portland. The difference between the way they organized, in my opinion, and what I had seen in New York and other places, they tried to bring around, bring together different groups of people rather than having one organization bring together several different organizations who had been affected and say, look, whatever we've done individually has not had the kind of impact upon the community that we would like. We would probably have a greater impact if we can bring people together. And plus, they were very aggressive in the way in which they went about challenging the status quo and challenging racism. They were very much involved in grassroots organizing and getting people active, involved in demonstrations, protests, and a number, a number of different ways. So brought the concept back to Portland, talked to a lot of different people, and found that there were many people who wanted to create a similar organization here. And we spent probably nine months meeting very quietly, we put together this organization, decide how we're going to function, and we, the one thing that we insisted upon is that people came together had to have had a history of being active and literally being fighters. That if you're going to come to the table, you're not going to get that just because you say you have some interest. You had to have shown that you've done something in the past. You have been successful. Um, in doing that, we, we um, decided that the first area would be education. That's what led, because of the disparity in education here in Portland, without getting into all the details, fought to change the way in which children, black children, were educated. They were mandatorily bust in Portland. The way, I'll just give you this real very quickly. What happened here, the way in which Portland addressed in the, uh, the area of integration, was they took all the schools in the black community, they used to be K-3. They removed the sixth, seventh, and eighth grades, and took those children in these approximately eight schools and mandatorily bust them all over Portland, uh, separating them and bust them. So kids who've grown up neighborhoods together, and friendships were just torn asunder. You've got these vacant classrooms in these buildings now. So they started these advanced early childhood education programs, very accelerated early childhood education programs. They're reserved for white children who live primarily on this side of the room who came in. Oh, by the way, these black children who were sent out of the community, their parents had to sign a piece of paper that said that when they graduated from middle school or eighth grade, they would not come back to the black community to go to high school. They wouldn't come back to Jefferson. They would not come back to, to Grant. Uh, they would have to continue their education in these schools and outside of the black community. The white children who came in, there were black children who lived across the street in these schools who could not get into these accelerated early childhood education programs. Now, one white child was ever forced to sign a statement that said that once you 
finish the early childhood program, you would stay in that grade school and go to first, second, third, fourth grade. White kids were able to come back, which the majority of them did, because school was in a white community. So that was integration. You got white kids going to school in the same building, the early child education. You got black kids in fourth, five, sixth grade. So you got body maintenance, that's education. There was never an issue in this city, one white kid was mandatorily bust out of their community. And for those of you who think that busing is a legitimate academic remedy, our research showed that the poorest performing school in Portland was a school of predominantly white John Ball in North Portland. And at no point in time did any white kid in John Ball ever get bused to another school for academic reasons. So we said this is a bankrupt academic remedy. It's only reserved for black kids, nobody else. If it's an academic remedy, remedy you think it's valid, then use it for poor white kids who are doing the worst academically in the city, never was done. So, and there was never a middle school in the black community. The guy who put the architect of the integration plan said, well, every kid will have a middle school. No middle school in the black community. That's what our fight was about, to end the mandatory busing, to say that any child in Portland should be able to attend any neighborhood school, that every neighborhood school should at least go up to the sixth grade, to the fifth grade, and that meant adding grades back to some schools. Some schools only went to third grade. So in the black community, so that's what our fight was about, creation of a middle school, in mandatory busing, make sure that quality education was available for children wherever they went. If a kid wanted to go to school somewhere else, sure, that's your, that's your privilege. Establish the middle school, and the big one was to make sure that uh, black teachers could teach in schools of black community. They even had a interpretation of some arcane piece of federal legislation, or regulation rather, in which they said that black teachers could not teach in schools in the black community because that was segregation. That's a fact, I'm not making this up. Black teachers teaching, in, we said, okay, great. So white teachers teaching in predominantly white schools, that's not segregation, no, no, no. But black teachers teaching in schools in predominantly black, and there was only, at that point in time, I think only one black principal in the city of Portland, so we fought to ensure that black teachers had the opportunity to teach wherever they wanted to, that there would be an accelerated effort to promote people to become black principals and teachers. Uh, and just finally, I'll just stop there. To, to, that was a big effort. We later got involved in police misconduct. The gentleman will talk about that. Economic development, whole South Africa issue, a number. The big thing, including whatever successes that we had, it was because it was a community effort. And people, you know, even though I was very kind of talking about my role, no one person ever does anything like this. Uh, these gentlemen up here, Abel, and one of other folks, we had whole families who were involved with the front, entire families. And our method of communication was old style. And if we were getting ready to have a rally or something, we would use cable, the radio station, press conferences, as well as we would go to churches on Sunday and put flyers on cars that were parked in the parking lot. We were so well organized, we had uh, church secretaries who would read announcements in church. That's the way we went about community organizing. It truly was a community effort that involved grassroots groups uh, organizing and what made us different than other organizations. Community-based, very aggressive. That we, they were talking about demonstrations that we had downtown. Charles was talking about security. You might think, why was it necessary? Some of the demonstrations we had involving police misconduct, they told us, you don't have a permit, so you can't demonstrate. We said, okay, we'll see you. <laughs> and that's an iffy position. Everybody we talking that you see up here, several different times were involved in demonstrations that could have resulted in them going to jail. Everybody. We felt that if you're going to make change, you have to be prepared to confront it and confront it as a community. And Security was important because we also made sure that nobody in our demonstration did anything stupid to provoke the police. Because that's, that, and I'm proud to say that no one, in any demonstration we ever had, we had many, ever got hurt, no property was destroyed, and nothing ever occurred that we did not want to occur. So I'll stop right there. That's the difference. We were very grassroots oriented, grassroots organized, and we were very aggressive and going after and making change. Demonstrations, whether they were legal or illegal, uh, shutting down school board meetings, that if you made a promise to us, we expected you to keep it. If you didn't, all hell was going to break loose. And this is the university side. Right now. Thank you.
Okay, my name is uh, Ben Priestley, and similar to Charles, I kind of uh, dabbled in things and I came up as an issue in the organization. Now, you heard Ryan say that uh, for about nine months, front members met in private. But what a lot of people don't know is that this organization, beginning around 1978-1979, met every Thursday for well eight, nine years. I mean, everybody would be in attendance to that. And that's how we got the continuity with the families and friends. Uh, but that, when I think about it, was an extraordinary thing to do, to come to a meeting every Thursday for several years. The only day we missed was Thanksgiving Day. It's the only day we took off. Any other time, we were around here somewhere doing something. Um, Charles had mentioned about we had done some work with uh, publications. I brought a few and could pass them around, and, and nobody keep any of them, folks. So <laughs> but this is some of the handiwork of uh, of the front. And I'd like to point out that we started off with a paper called the Advocate, which was local. The national organization had this convention here in Portland, and as a result, the Central Committee designated us to be the uh, writers and chronicles of, uh, of the national organization. So we moved from a local to a national. We got a few publications here uh, that, that we put together. Like Ryan said, I can't remember those questions. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with myself. Uh, so 
the front part. I say, oh boy, I like this, you know. So I say, well, these are troublemakers, and I want to join the troublemakers. You know? And uh, that is what what uh, kept me here, I think, primarily. So time passed, and before I knew it, I'd been in it up to the city. And that, like I said, 1978. But I think if you just do some research on Argonian, do some research on two black dailies, a weakness, uh, Portland, Portland Scanner, the Portland Observer. Uh, there was also another paper, Oregon Journal, is that right? Where a lot of coverage was uh, placed uh, and talked about as far as our organization goes. And uh, as mentioned, we did not do everything according to Paul. Uh, I can remember when we talked about the South African issues. There was a, an esteemed gentleman connected with the uh, council. Uh, and then no problem naming it. His name was Van Kelp. And I can remember going somewhere in the southwest, we didn't know where we were going, but we were looking for Van Kelp's home. <laughs> so when I say our conventional stuff, we would pick at your house. We'd call you out. And uh, uh, at one point, Van Kelp was so shaken, he wanted to meet with us and, and, and offer to send us to South Africa. So we said, no way, you know. So uh, <clears throat> that was uh, quite a time. And uh, we still got a lot of people around here who know, know some of these stories. And another interesting thing about our structure, as I said, we met, and we mentioned Mrs. Richardson, who, who was the secretary. But all we had after Mrs. Richardson was two vice chairs, Ryan Fern and Reverend Jackson. And that was it. We wanted to find out who, who was who. You, you wouldn't know. You know, because you just didn't know the roles that we played. And we alternated a lot of different roles uh, while we were involved. Now, I don't want another question. We'll bring you back. Let's go okay. to uh, Richard Brown, and I'll ask you to reflect on William McClendon, Bill McClendon. Oh, okay. And his contributions, and I'll come back to you. Okay. Well, I'm from, I shouldn't need this microphone. I'm from New York, and I lived on the sixth floor, and then we had to talk to each other and yell out the window. Um, as, as I was introduced, um, my role started as a photographer. You know, I came to Portland. In fact, in fact, and I forget this all the time, um, I got here in 76, and I vaguely remember Ronnie coming over where I was living, to talk to me about um, something, but I wasn't interested. I wasn't interested. You know, I just gotten out the service, spent 20 years, and I wasn't ready for nothing. And um, but because of my photography, I got the job as a photographer at the Portland Observer, and just covered everything that was going on in the city. And a lot of the activities that the front were involved. No, the front was involved in a lot of activities. So I was always at the activities that they were covering. And you know, as a photographer, you want to kind of um, disappear. You just want to be there and nobody paying any attention to you. But the activities that they were involved in became so compelling that you just couldn't sit there without saying something. And you know, once I started saying something, shutting me up was impossible. <laughs> Um, I think one of the things that really um, pulled me in was the education piece, where we set up sites to do alternatives um, to the school system, to supplement what was going on in school systems on Saturdays. And I got involved that way, and um, during the uh, Sandinista Contra fiasco in, in Nicaragua, uh, I got involved with that. I was concerned that um, black people live in Nicaragua. And every time white folk go down there, when they talk about it, these folks are absent in, absent in their conversation. They didn't see them. Um, I, was at, I was 
had an opportunity to go to Nicaragua, and I went, and in the airport, you know, in, the air, in Mexico, the airplane that took us from Mexico to Managua, the pilot was black, the students were black, and I'm wondering where these folks got their planes from, because all over Nicaragua, they're black people. Um, I stayed down there for a while, representing the Rainbow Coalition and the Front. Um, came back and did a lot of work in that area, uh, mainly photo exhibits and talking about what I saw down there. Another opportunity was the environmental movement. We got involved in the environmental movement. Again, um, the Front was doing a lot of things in a lot of areas. And I just thought, well, that's an area that nobody's working in, and I could do that. So uh, I got involved in the environmental movement. And finally, when all that kind of died down, when the environmental movement just appeared to be a mountain that wasn't going to be conquered. You know, they were setting their ways. They knew what they needed to do, and they were going to do it the way they wanted to do it, regardless of who was involved with them. I remember going, Abel and I went to a conference, in, a side conference in New York. And um, these folks are so insensitive, let me say that. The one, Greenpeace, Greenpeace, had a, a man that had, must have hitchhiked from upstate New York to the conference. And we're getting ready to break up. And this guy doesn't have any way to get back home. So he gets up and make a plea to the group. And they just you know, shut them off and go on with their business. Well, we had to do something about that. And um, we ended up getting money um, <coughs> by passing the hat for the guy to get back. But this is one of their own people. He was Indian, though. You know, um, those are the kind of issues that just became overwhelming for me. I joined the Riverkeeper here, trying to get them to get people involved from our community in the environmental movement. You know, those are things that we can be involved in if you let us know what's going on. You know, um, they didn't want, you know, they were busy. They had their agenda, so I got out of that. And um, during a lot of the police activities, one of the problems, I'm a few years old, and one of the problems all my life that I've seen is anytime there's a confrontation between the police and black community especially, Everybody's hollering at everybody, and nothing really gets accomplished. And I guess I decided that we need to do something different, because bad things were happening to the folks in Portland. And you know they need to be pushed. But I felt that they needed to be some other pressures applied. And I thought that I could apply some pressure from I use a yardstick as, a, um, as an example. Um, the community and the cops are on 0 and 36. And I felt that answers were in, at 18 inches. So I kind of put myself at 18 inches, at 18 inches, and got involved with police and police work. The um, mayor, Tom Potter, started community policing, which really opened it up to the community. Um, wasn't real supported by police, though, because now you have citizens being involved in what's going on. But the table for policing had already turned, they weren't going to go back to doing it the way they were doing it. They're going to have to be more covert about it. And you know, they lived up to it. Um, but I got involved with that and have been involved with police stuff ever since. Uh, I think things are slowly changing. My purpose for being on the board uh, that oversees training, in Portland every time something crazy happens, Training is always the solution. Well, if you get trained before you're a cop, before you become a cop, what's missing? So I decided that as a member of this board, I could sit in on classes. So I go down to Salem maybe once a week, twice a week, to sit in on the training so I know what they're doing. And they have given me the liberty to inject my perspective in the training which I think is huge, you know. Um, it's amazing going down there as much as I do and hearing cops saying the same things that I say when they're teaching this stuff. But when the men and women get out in the field, it's something different. 
you know. So it's been a good experience for me. I'm going to continue that as long as I can and try to put some pressure on in Portland, you know, that's my concern, in Portland, about um, doing things differently. And, and they resist. Uh, for all the uh, great things people think Rosie Sides is doing, she was able to dismantle community policing single-handedly. Dismantle it. No longer exists. Input from the citizens is superficial. I also serve on the Citizens Crime Commission, and when they were going to close the precinct in North, in North Precinct, they came to the Citizens Crime Commission to get their buy-in, didn't go to the community. So I made that an issue that we should stay out of it. You know, if they want to change things, they can do it on their own or they can go to the community and talk about it. And they didn't take a stand on it. So um, I think that being involved for so long, you know, one of the things about all of us, when we started, our hair was black. <laughs> you know, so being involved for so long, Nobody can get up in front of a group and say, well, I think this is a good idea. Because there aren't very many things they're going to come up with that didn't come out of the heads of the poets that were involved in the Black United Front. And I remind them of it. So they have to be real careful when I'm sitting in the audience and they do these things. You know? And it's paid off. Again, longevity is great because they can't pull the wall over your eyes if you know what's going on. If you've been around the corner, they can't pull the wall over your eyes. And you know, one of the things I like to do is talk. So if I keep on, nobody else will get a chance to say anything. <laughs> and let, let, me, let me say, let me answer one of the questions. Now, what was the difference between our organization and all the other organizations? I think we were committed. We were activists, and active or, activist is a code word for no pay. So there were no string. You couldn't pull anybody's string in the organization. A lot of the organizations, they'll be with you until you're doing something controversial. And then there'll be a block behind while you're marching. You know, they'll be there, but they'll be in the background. So I think that one of the things that our group did, the Black and Black Front did, that none of the other groups, you know, they told me if you can't say something good about people, don't say nothing. But none of the other groups got out in front of issues. You know, they had their agendas, and usually their agendas was not to piss anybody off. Charles Myrick, you've had an opportunity to reflect on some of the uh, discussion and conversation, and, and I'll just uh, review the questions again and then ask Charles to come up. And in, in the remaining time we have, if you all could also um, reflect on the contribution, the contribution and the legacy of uh, William McClendon and how uh, Bill McClendon's uh, voice and work influenced uh, the work of the Black United Front chapter here in Portland. And again, the questions are, how and why did you become involved with the Black United Front? What was your role? What were the key issues happening in Portland that the Black United Front focused on? How was the Front similar and or different from other organizations representing black people in Portland at the time? In what ways was the Black United Front effective? And what ways was it not? And how did the Black United Front communicate with its constituency? Charles, would you like to? I like Richard, I'm a man of few words. Few words. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, well, first of all, I say, I, I also our tactics, I mean, we, we, were, we weren't just a radical, arrogant type group, I should say. We went to the other people and gave them a chance. How are you going to deal with this issue? You know, nothing happened. The front would get it done. And we generally got it done. Whatever those tactics we use, we, we use. Um, and also, I want to say, in terms of the newspaper, none of us, at least me, man, Mr. Priestley, he had experience on doing magazines and that kind of stuff. He had no idea about the newspaper. <laughs> so, 
and most of the, the layout and stuff you see on the idea that they had. So it was quite experimental. So I learned quite a bit also being involved in front in terms of the organic What was the question? I'm younger, I can't think as quickly. I left them there in front of you. Right. How else was the uh, organization uh, affected? Or not? Or Charles, just speak to your uh, your role and your uh, contributions to all of those marches and demonstrations and protests that uh, were held over the years. Some of your uh, remembrances. Uh, what stands mm -hmm. out for you? Well. <laughs> you, were at, you were there. You were at all of them. And had a voice. <laughs> um, God, I don't know anymore. <laughs> I was involved with so many of them. And I think a lot of the organizers behind those uh, uh, marches and demonstrations also sometimes got organized outside of those Thursday meetings. Sometimes we just run and I just that we'd be at my house, his house, listen to music and come with these ideas and you know. How I became the channel, I don't know. Uh, as you see, I don't speak very loud like Mr. Brown, but <laughs> I did all the chance. So. But I don't know, I think the front had a, 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 a big effect in my life. Growing up in Portland, Oregon, um, a lot of people don't realize how racist this town really was. I call it Portland Flight. You know, uh, smiling your face, turning away, and something else is going on. And so, I can remember, I, I can remember growing up as a kid walking down the street. I lived over in Northeast Portland, close to where the Lord Center was built. I watched the building Lord Center. We were only blacks on blacks on the block. My grandmother always told us the stories that when we came there, to go to move in the house, we had the police department, people from the fire department. People from the other community stand on the porch and we'll let them move in. She always tells that story. She had to call a lawyer, a Jewish lawyer, who did whatever he did and we got to move in. Next door to us was this German lady. In our yard we had every fruit tree, every vine, grape vines, everything. And we were eating off of those and the kids got sick. Just trying to figure out why we were getting sick. You know. Of course, my grandmother and I got a Jewish doctor. <laughs> and explained to her what was going on. Well, the lady next door was pointing all on her step. You know. oh you know. But we came out okay. Uh, I can remember as a kid walking down the street, going to the store. I'll never forget this. It's on the corner of 14th and Northeast Thompson. And there was this big, you know, my guy, just a little guy. This is my guy. I said, well, hi, how you doing? I said, hi. He said, well, how you doing, Lord? Same boat, spit at my feet. Now I didn't know what that meant. I really didn't. I, 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 but I knew it wasn't right. I knew it wasn't right. And I don't think I, I don't know if I ever even told my brother about it. But I knew it wasn't right. You know. I can remember being in, the reason why I'm, I'm so compassionate about the education thing, I remember being in Irvington School. And I'm sitting in the classroom. I think I was probably only, there might have been two other black kids in the class. And we were in a reading group, and then we were in spelling, and she was writing these words on the wall. I mean, I'm sorry, on, on, the, on the board. And I raised my hand, she's never called me. And this time, my hand was only hanging up. And she said, Charles, you're not ready for that now. Now, I never forgot, I feel that right now, saying that, you know. To this day, I'm a poor spell. I'm not going to write it I'll write now. I'll read anything. Got extensive libraries, read anything. But I, so my issue with the school was very, very important because I had kids that was growing up and so I'm going to those schools. You know. So the front gave me that. This is just the idea of to step out in front and say, we're going to deal with this and that's it. You know, I'm a radical guy. I don't, I'm not. That's just what you need. I'm very few words. What we don't do. <laughs> so that's what I'm at. But well, I could go on and on. Charles, uh, there's, there's something else. Mm -hmm. um, as, as I see you standing there, and as I hear you speaking, your family was involved yeah. yeah, in the true. Black United Front. Yeah. Your mother, right. your sister, 
the little ones. Yeah, all of them. It's a, you're an example of what um, yeah. Brian yeah. was speaking about mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. that the, the Black United Front was about family. Oh, yeah, no and question. Family. Yeah, yeah. My grandma, grandmother, who is uh, 91 years old now, uh, she was involved from sitting in her chair. Yeah. <laughs> but she was there. She was in the line. She was there. Yeah, yeah, my own family was involved. My, my uh, mother likes to say that she got me involved. <laughs> part, of, part of the organizing thing before we uh, uh, were meeting at the uh, King facilities, I can remember being in the Tommy John bookstore with Ron, just, we were just, you know, and I was younger than so I'm just listening to all this stuff. We were organizing, putting it together, putting it together. You know. So yeah, my own family was involved. My sister was involved. She was here. She could tell you some stories. Uh, uh, my mother, I think she was, a, was she a treasurer or something? Yeah, she was involved. She still got history. So yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was good. Thank you, Charles. Yeah. Thank you. the presence of Joyce Harris. Joyce Harris is co-chair of the African American Alliance. Joyce Harris is also the former director of the Black Educational Center. You heard a reference to uh, the Black Educational Center earlier in the uh, presentation. Uh, questions from the students? One thing for Charles, I to say this. As one of the sisters in the community, along with Abel and all the rest of us that were out there, one thing that Charles and those brothers up there did, they created safety for us. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't always a nice environment in the many of the things that were done. These brothers would go out of their way. I mean, if we left the meeting, we didn't just, you know, you say, okay, sister, see you later. They would walk you to your car, make sure you got in your car. And so that I want to say, Charles may not realize it, but I always felt safe. The sisters always felt safe. And we always knew that if anybody disrespected us in any way, these brothers would take them down. I can tell you, <laughs> I have seen them. They, they, they. <laughs> well, it's the truth. I mean, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about how our men need to be in the, on the front line and these brothers did that. And this brother here, Charles, like he said, he's a man of a few words. But he's one of them brothers that you knew that you did not cross the line with him, especially when it came to the women and the children. So I want to acknowledge that. Thank you very much, yeah. Warrior Brother. Yes. We have about 10 minutes left, so let's go to some questions from uh, students right here. Well, um, I was going to ask this uh, more privately afterwards, but then I, I realized that it might be better to raise it uh, collectively kind of an issue now. We, there's a, um, uh, a situation on campus right now where certain elements of our uh, academic leadership are trying to reduce the effectiveness and the scope of our, uh, what they're calling our diversity programs, uh, mainly black studies, Chicano studies, women's studies, and uh, native studies. So, um, and we're, we're trying to sort of organize a campaign to you know, um, combat that. And so I was going to ask for some, possibly some advice on how, if you were trying to organize students against an initiative like that, what, what kind of things would you do? Um, in your experience, what would be effective? I know it's kind of a broad question, but. You, you know, um, a lot of times when you have those real flashy issues, you get a lot of people come out, and then as time goes on, they disappear. I think the challenge is to find people who are committed to that struggle. And it may not be a lot. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. You know, so you sit down with those few people and figure out how you get more people involved, knowing that they may not stay, but that you can maximize what you get out of them while they're there. Uh, what are the things that you may want to do is gather the the data, and that's what we always did. Any issue that we addressed, we always did our research, every one of them. So we knew the issue as well as the people that we were confronting. Probably even better. So I gathered my data and looked what are the demographics of the student population here? What percent of the students are 
female, what percent are Hispanic, what percent are Native American, what percent are black? I, mean, I have a suspicion, I know the answer, but that's just a suspicion. And I would gather that data and then I would additionally look at, well certainly for uh, populations, Hispanic, Native American, black, what are the graduation rates? I have, I have a suspicion about that. Just a suspicion. I gather my data, and the gradua graduation rates for women. I would take a look at what are the areas they're majoring in. What what areas what majors are they almost absent? I have my suspicion about that. I don't know. Then I would take a look at the faculty. What's the representation of those groups on the faculty tenure? What the tenure? positions on the faculty. When I gathered all that together, then going forward, make the presentation that there either there is or there is not an institutional commitment to these groups as evidenced by the data. Not, not by what I feel and not by what people say. And I'm not talking about ceremonial positions. And so this is the data. This is, the, this is either evidence of a commitment or a lack of commitment. And in doing this, supporting these groups is a way in which to strengthen that commitment and build on it and set up some goals. I said, why should not the faculty, why should not the student population of this urban institution reflect the population of this urban area? And I think that's one that, that's been asked for many, many years. It's nothing new for this institution. Faces mm -hmm. change with that question. So that would be my suggestion, do your research first. So if you have your research, then no matter who comes into the meeting,